Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out this evening. Um, I want to welcome you to our first free market speaker series event of the spring semester. For those of you who may not know me, I'm Professor Peter Calciano. I'm Professor of Economics here at the College of Charleston and the Director for the Center for Public Choice and Market Process. The mission of the Center for Public Choice and Market Process is to expand the economic, political, and moral foundations of the free society and the understanding of our students on these topics. We, are, um, we do this through a variety of events and programming, including our free market speaker series. And as you can see behind me here, as we've got the slides coming up, right, these are a series of events. Most, recent, most importantly, what's coming up is our Adam Smith Week. It's March 21st through the 25th. Um, and so we've got a variety of great speakers coming up, and I would encourage you to uh, check out the center's webpage, check out our social media pages, and on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all of it to learn more about what the center does. Okay. Uh, we do faculty research and we have a couple of our faculty research fellows here with us this evening. So if you've got questions afterwards, we want to talk to them. And one of the things that we have that is sort of at the center of our program is our market process scholars. So our market process scholars are a multi-year mentoring program involved in the center and they get an opportunity then to work with faculty research as well as partake in all the activities of the center and then some. Um, and so with that, what I want to do is introduce one of our market process scholars, Emily Cook, to introduce our speaker for this evening. Hi, so like Dr. Calcano said, my name is Emily Cook, and I'm one of the market process scholars, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. So Dr. Lisa Clemens is an assistant professor and economics program director in the Department of Economics and Finance at Southern Illinois University at Birdsville, where her teaching specializes in public economics courses, mainly pertaining to taxation and expenditure at the local, state, and national levels. Um, Dr. Clemens is also a research affiliate of the Nee Center for the Study of Occupational Regulation at West Virginia University, as well as the co-founder and leader of the Scope of Practice and Medical Licensure Research Group in the Arkansas Center for Research and Economics at the University of Central Arkansas. Her research uses applied spatial and econ econometric methods to just, just whoa, sorry, to determine how policy changes affect labor markets by studying how to create environments that facilitate healthy economic growth and business development through research into the determinants of entry, operation, and exit of firms, laborers, and consumers. Her research has been published in numerous academic journals, such as the British Journal of Industrial Relations and the Annals of Regional Science, and discussed in several news outlets. Dr. Bowens is here to talk to us today by introducing a new data set, discussing how it can be used, and exploring how it can help us understand business ownership in marginalized communities. So, Welcome, Dr. Clemens. Uh, hope everybody's doing well. I'm actually gonna switch over to my slides at the same time as talking to you, but just, you know, I'm Alicia Clemens and I'm, I'm pretty happy to be here today. I think this is gonna be a lot of fun. So to go ahead and preface where all of these things are going, um, I myself, oh, oh gosh, did my slides go down? No, there, there they are. <laughs> we got it, don't you worry. For a long time, I've been working on the idea of where do firms locate and why do they locate there, right? And I, and I realized a lot of this is actually based in regulation. There might be some environments that are more friendly to businesses coming in or being able to move there or being able to start. There might be an easier pathway to entrepreneurship in some places rather than others. But I realized the major thing that was missing from the literature that we really need to talk about is minority business ownership and how regulations at the city level might might affect these rates or might affect how certain businesses flourish or don't flourish because if we can understand this relationship in between regulations and business i think this is a way that we can start to be able to talk and have a discussion of how how to have an equal playing field or access to markets right so i think this is pretty pretty fun for the most part all the pictures that you'll see in the background are at least charleston so that's nice <laughs> before we get started um who on here started a business before? Show of hands. One. Okay. Two. Nice. Can you tell me about that process? Like, what, what did you have to go through? What were the steps? I mean, for me, it's just a small business. So I'm a um, residential real, uh, realtor. Okay. So I just had to go through all the licensing. I'm in the process of getting out of LLC. Just, just, you know, save some uh, money. Yeah. It's fairly easy. It's just finding a verb and becoming a Okay, 
so you got to find a brokerage. So you have to file an LLC. Well, then that means that you also probably need a trademark. And at some point, you need to be able to talk to different places. You have to get signed up for your taxes, both at the state and federal level, especially if you're going to hire employees. If you're going to hire employees, there's a whole other list of paperwork that goes along with that. And it's not necessarily something that's always accessible or easy for people to do, especially if this is something that might be a multiple week process. And it might be something that, that might be confusing or there might be additional hurdles. Because while it might be a little bit easier to, to start a business in Charleston, it may not be the same in every single city, right? Where sometimes this process can take longer. So that's kind of where, where I wanted to go to. But first, I just want to talk about some of the benefits of lots of business ownership in marginalized communities, right? Uh, the, those communities that may not have the same set of resources or, or abilities or, or access to the same market resources, right? Uh, a higher prevalence of business owners by members of marginalized community has been associated with more job opportunities for people within that community. If you have more businesses in marginalized uh, communities, then you have more hiring, more empowerment, more feelings of confidence, um, new businesses being started, and, and a lot of these feelings among business owners. High rates of minority business ownership has been associated with leading to higher rates of college education and access for members of those communities in these areas. And companies with diversity among their ownership structure has also been seen to better withstand things such as economic downturns or uh, have different sort of strategies for being able to come up with complex problems or being understand complex problems. All right, so there's lots of benefits to having this high prevalence of, of business ownership in marginalized communities, and it's something that I kind of want to think about. And the reason I want to think about it is because while I was working on all of this work on firms and understanding how businesses change, a, a statistic really hit me that, that I wanted to think more about. The first is that 18.7% of businesses in the United States are minority owned. That sounds like a lot, right? That's nearly one in five businesses. But 42.2% of the US population is from a marginalized racial or ethnic group. Those numbers are not the same. And I realized, well, why is there this huge difference? Could there be some sort of reason, even a regulatory reason, that might be causing some of these differences, right? Lots of regulations were started in the early 1900s uh, and have been prevailing or differencing over time. How does this change or these differences, especially at city levels, affect access to markets or the ability to enter markets? Uh, a couple like interesting things related with these same statistics of just where, where are business owners now, now that we have a little bit more information. Well, Hispanic business owners have a large presence in construction of owning about 15.6% of all construction firms in the United States. Likewise, there's significant rates of Hispanic owned businesses in accommodation and food services, as well as professional scientific and technological services. Asian owned businesses uh, account for the largest subsection of accommodation and food sector by far. Um, one, uh, being in a place like Charleston, I'm sure you're used to having wonderful, amazing, diverse and fantastic foods that, that's not always available everywhere. Uh, black and African American owned businesses account for about 32% of healthcare and social service firms. And there's approximately 24,000 American Indian and Alaskan Native owned businesses and about 6,700 that are owned by Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders. And I wanted to understand what motivates these businesses or what sort of environment helps them to succeed. Right? Okay. So I'm not going to go too far into the literature. One thing that you might hear me saying every now and then is the idea of an ethnic enclave. These are just geographic concentrations of entrepreneurial activity of similar racial and cultural groups. Has anybody ever heard of Chinatown? Um, part, parts of different New York? Yeah, sure. Have um, you ever heard about like the Italian district for food where there might be lots of Italian food in one location? Yeah, I'm getting nods. Wonderful. These sorts of places, that they're called ethnic enclaves when, when we discuss them within the literature because it's just concentration, geographic concentration of similar types of businesses. Understanding places such as ethnic enclaves lets us know, okay, well, what's different about that neighborhood? Or is this neighborhood concentrated geographically because there might be some sort of need for hiring or, or need of community in this area for flourishing businesses? So that's something that we have to consider within, within this discussion. So within the literature, which I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, reducing barriers that limit the size and scope of American minority business communities began in earnest in the 1960s and 70s. So a lot of these policies originally came in in the early 1900s, ramped up during the progressive era. Well, the progressive era was before the Civil Rights Act, right? 
many different types of regulations were, were put in place in a way to be able to differentiate communities or to be able to keep out certain types of businesses within communities. Being able to scale back some of these regulations or thinking about not necessarily having them in certain areas, that started to, to happen in policy in the 1960s and 70s, but didn't really happen in earnest. There's still huge differences in how things might affect different community those groups, right? Marginalized groups regularly experience race-based discrimination in small business lending. Has anybody ever heard of the idea of redlining? Yeah, some people have. Okay, it's, it's the idea that there are certain areas where loans just weren't available in the same capacity to individuals. Uh, it was a way of being able to almost target certain neighborhoods that, that ended up being predominantly Black almost always, right? Uh, lack of access to markets through these types of regula regulatory hurdles. These can cause persistent poverty problems. It can reduce new job opportunities. It can reduce hiring. And when you reduce job offerings and, and hiring because there's a lack of, of community and businesses within that community, then that also affects things such as college attainment rates, which can later affect new business development. So this is almost a cyclical persistent problem if, if barriers exist that might cause long-standing issues. Right? Are you following me? Fantastic. All right. So unfortunately, we've never really been able to look at this at the local level before. We've been able to say, ah, well, this is a problem in the United States, or this is something that we need to talk about. But local level business owner information, that is new. And for a long time in the literature, we haven't been able to think about what is happening at the local level spatial piece. Most studies, these most studies that we reference here or that are within the literature, these are country-based studies where we look at the whole system. Or it might have just one or two cities looking at individual neighborhoods, but not being able to think distinctly in between different cities. So the main question I wanted to get to, are regulations creating barriers for business owners and marginalized communities? And the basic simple question, is this correlated, right? Do we see a differences in these regulations? Are these differences in these regulations correlated with the differences that we see in business ownership? We would love to get a causal idea. We'd love to look at that over time, but we need to at least start the literature, right? We first need to look at what's happening at these city level areas. So there's three main challenges that the literature has had so far, right? All the people wanting to look at what's happening with minority business ownership, they face one of three problems. We're going to try to talk about all of those problems and come up with a solution today. The first one is that there's been a lack of business regulation at the municipal level. The idea of having city level information because states might differ, but really, honestly, a lot of the, the policies that are going to affect individuals, those are city level decisions. So there's been a lack of city level or municipal level information for a long time. So we're going to try to address that piece first. Then we're gonna have a second problem. The second problem is no available data sets on minority business ownership. Um, that's been a huge problem. It's not that no one wanted to address this question. It's that there's no census data available for this question that's publicly available outside of working at a Federal Reserve or RDC right, or at the census. There's been such little information on business owners that it's just a question we haven't been able to tackle in the social sciences. So I'm going to address that question, that question. And then we're gonna talk about the lack of research, just the, the fact that people aren't being able to get into the space and what can happen from there. So part of why I came here today was to introduce a new data set. Uh, Pete thought it was interesting. I think it's pretty interesting. It's called the Doing Business North America. It's put out um, by Arizona State University and a really awesome picture that they have there. The Doing Business North America data set, which is published through the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty, uh, contains regulatory data for about 134 different country, or cities, right? So this is city level information that is comparable. So for the first time ever, we have a data set that we can look at and we can see what is the difference in between Charlotte and Charleston. What is the difference between Atlanta and Charleston in at least the same context, right? Because for a long time, we've had a lot of these regulations, but it looks like it's comparing apples to oranges. Part of the reason of this study and the purpose of this study is to put it all in the same language. So we can start to look at apples to apples because they go and they try to answer these regulatory questions and, and make observations on what the environment is in all of these cities. Now we're gonna talk about the United States in this class right now because the, that's, that's the question I'm thinking about. But this data set can be replicated in both Mexico and Canada because it does have available information for both Mexico and Canada. So out of the 134 cities, uh, across 92 different states, provinces, and federal districts, uh, that's, that's a lot. And when we start to break it down, this is a collection of data that, that has nearly 120,000 data points between all those cities over time. So we're going to be looking at things like commercial zoning, 
Uh, we're going to be looking at things such as federal, federally mandated leave policies, if they exist. What sort of other leave policies are there for maternal care? Uh, what, what's minimum wage like? Uh, what, what are some of the different amounts of paperwork that have to be done in order to start a business? Having this sort of common language gives us a way to create 28 different indicators over six categories in order to score and rank cities. So for the first time, we can see where people rank in different areas, right? So this is a cross-country study in case anybody's interested in using it. How many people in here are market process scholars? Just a quick question. A few? All right, so we got a lot who might be interested in the future. How many of you have done research for a class where you have to look up a data set and you have to start thinking about a problem? A few more? All right, then we need to get back to a more basic question. How many are freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors? We got a lot of sophomores. Okay, well, that's good. That means that you're now at a point where you can start to think about the next few years of your life, right? Where you're going to start thinking about ideas such as grad school or what you want to do after college or how you want to try to save the world or help the world in your own special individual way. Being able to think about some of these questions now is an important piece because your classes, when you become juniors and seniors, will often want you to be able to take these questions that you're having and start to use data to understand them. This is a clean and interesting data set that's able to make these cross-country comparisons at the city level, which is very unique. Uh, for anybody who knows data, that is a pain to do. So that's why it's something particularly special in this case. And it ends up just ranking these different areas from Colorado Springs, which was just the most business regulation friendly to be able to go to out of the cities within the sample, uh, all the way down to some other really interesting ones, such as Durham or Henderson or Salt Lake City, to places where we may not have the same sort of regulatory friendliness to new businesses coming in or, or to be able to maintain your business over time. So this sort of interesting comparison city is just fascinating but let's talk about what variables are in this data set right we're going to try to put them into six main categories in here the first category is going to be the idea of starting a business so what pieces of information would be related to starting a business using all these individual pieces of information they end up using a weighting matrix to be able to understand or create a score and a rank for each one of these policies following me fantastic all right, so when starting a business, we're gonna think about the number of procedures you have to go through to start a business. Are you going to multiple businesses? You said that you had to fill out what? Um, well, I don't have to do anything in regards to that. LLC. That's just my yeah. personal preference. What paperwork have you put in so far? Uh, pretty much just, I have to just look at my basic information, um, license, social, um, oh, first so that's actually pretty simple, right? You're gonna have the procedure of going and getting your individual information. You're going to have the procedure of being able to list it on the website. But some places there's much more to that. Sometimes you have to see if there's someone competing. If you have a name or trademark that's already used within that state and then having a registration for that. Having the tax component. Each of these different procedures are things that we have to think about when we're starting a business. And this also includes things such as the time to start a business, cost to start a business, the cost of as a percentage of a business owner's income. Because it turns out a $200 business license is going to be very, very different for someone in rural Mississippi as it would be for a place in New York City, where cost of living and incomes might be drastically different, right? Uh, then we have the idea of employing workers. So our next category is what sort of business environment is there related to being able to employ workers? Is there a minimum wage? What is the minimum wage? Uh, what's the minimum wage applicable to workers as a person? Or how do we have things? related percentage of income? Is there paid maternity leave? Is there paid paternity leave? Is there severance pay? Is there so on and so forth, number of sick days that are available? Paid sick days are, are non-paid sick days that the city guarantees for you to be able to have because the regulations are very different depending on if you have the space and time for these points, right? Then we have things such as getting electricity, which I know that there's going to be a lot of changes coming up into. And I think Mike Giberson might actually be in the Zoom with some information about the, the getting electricity later. Paying taxes, land and space use. What are we doing with this? Um, well, how many things do you have to go through in order to transfer a title or to be able to transfer property? Uh, how, what, what sort of parking do you have to have? There's a really interesting study right now, or not study, I guess just more thing that I read in the news about a car shop owner who he fixes engines and his city had ended up making it so the minimum lot size now has to be 20 spaces. He works on one or two cars at a time. He's a one man shop. For him to be able to have 20 spaces would require taking down any building nearby him or being able to purchase another building. That was such a significant cost that he now had to close down his business. 
So that's something that we need to think about. How do things like this factor into the equation? How long does it take to resolve insolvency? That one actually doesn't differ too much across the United States. That's more when we talk about Mexico and Canada because in resolving insolvency, we have federal bankruptcy laws here in the United States. There are some states that, that are more forgiving, but for the most part, it's all one thing. So this data tries to measure the ease of doing business. How, from a regulatory perspective, how easy is it to start and maintain a business within a different city so that we can finally start to understand and explain this. If you're going to use this data on your own projects, it's currently available for 2019, 2020, 2021, and they are finalizing the data for 2022. It's not a lot of years, but more years are going to be coming out over time. And this is sort of the initial exploration of what can we do with this data. We need to find out if it's useful, if it's interesting, and what, what sort of possibilities it has. All right, of course, the main question is, how's Charleston, right? Uh, everybody kind of wants to know that about their own city. I'm going to both compliment and rag on y'all a little bit. Okay, so you're currently ranked seventh in the ease of doing business with a score of 76.11. Uh, when it comes to just the procedures for starting a business, not necessarily hiring workers or being in a business or, or all the different pieces that might come with you trying to get a job at a different business. But for the business owners, how easy is it for them to do business? They actually rank really high. You actually rank number one in employing workers. So the regulatory environment related to the number of hoops that you have to go through in order to hire a worker. Now, that doesn't mean that workers always want to work. Well, I'm pretty sure we've all, we've all seen around here that hospitality and tourism is hurting. There may not be people who are willing to work in these situations much longer, or, or they might want a different sort of environment, right? So this isn't necessarily how individuals feel, but when it comes to the paperwork hurdles for a business, how is the friendliness to being able to hire those workers and get them working? It's actually very friendly in Charleston. You're also ranked 16th in land and space use. Uh, turns out, did y'all know it's hard to find parking in Charleston? <laughs> I know, that's shocking, right? Uh, did you know that it's very, very difficult to put in a new building in Charleston where most things are considered historic districts? Yeah. So this, this is not a perfect measure for this one. Now, you got a couple others. You rank 38th in starting a business. Turns out it's a little bit messy to start a business here. Um, 26th in getting electricity. 49th in ease of paying taxes. Uh, have you all ever had a headache trying to file your taxes? Yes. Yes. If you haven't, you probably should. Remember to find your 1098s that the school gives you because you get to be able to write off things that you purchase for your school activities such as buying books, right? But for the most part, it turns out that there's actually a lot of headaches and process that are in Charleston for being able to file your taxes that aren't necessarily around in other states. So that's important to know as a business owner. So because of the DBNA, we have now been able to address the first main issue that's existed in the literature so far. The fact that there is not city level data for us to be able to look at this minute or, or lower level ge geography. Okay, let's look at the second one. We don't know anything about minority business owners. That's a huge issue when you want to study minority business ownership. So this is where my stuff comes in. So this is a lot of what I've been working on for, for a long time now. I have data in between 2000 and, 20, and 2021 related to business owners and CEOs of, of every business in the United States. This, this data set was acquired through a popular sales lead company whose job is to go out and make sure that they know every business that's, that's opening for the purpose of being able to call and annoy them. This is similar to the NETS data, but more affordable. Uh, so this covers about 15 million businesses in the United States, but I know exactly where they're located. I know exactly how many employees they have. I know information about their square footage, uh, their latitude and longitude, and most importantly, I know about their business owners. Um, I'm actually about to talk to you about how I match business owner names to racial and ethnic information, but I can match about 8.8 .8 million of them. That's a lot of business owners to be able to understand, okay, where are they? What are these communities like? So let's kind of go through some things that this has. Name of business owner or primary CEO or administration. We have the name of the business and contact information. If something looks weird, I can go look it up and try to figure out what's going on. I know about their ownership structure. Is this a private company? Is this a public company? Are they on a stock? Or have they filed their LLC yet? Or are they an individual? These are important questions to know because the differences in what those communities are gonna be like or the needs of those businesses are going to be very different. All right, we can think about the number of employees. It doesn't matter if you have twice the number of businesses if they can't hire anybody, right? 
So thinking about that difference in between what are the prevalence of businesses and the hiring patterns of those businesses, that's a very important thing to think about too. Estimated sales, overhead, square footage, uh, latitude and longitude. So basically I can figure out where these businesses are in a city. And I know a little bit of information about the business owner. So that's kind of where we get into this, this creative part. This is sort of fun. I think it's neat. Some of you are considering research. Some of y'all might decide to do research at some point. Some people are probably just here because you're like, ah, it's a weird topic. Let's go check it out. But how did I start to develop and deal with this issue that there was a lack of information available? So I came up with a three-part system. The first step, name identification and standardization. So this means that for every name within the database for this business owner, I need to make it something searchable. So I take out the capitalization. I concatenate them together to take away dashes, things that I'm able to observe. And don't worry, we're gonna give you an example. So for example, uh, I'm Alicia Clemens. I would have A-L-I-C-I-A, P-L-E-M-M-O-N-S, all lowercase put together, kind of gives me some information about, about what I am. Or I can separate just what the last name is, which you would find to be the most interesting and useful way. So first we need to clean the data. That's our way of cleaning the data. You standardize the names of all these business owners to deal with the fact that we can put it into these statistical programs. How many people in here have used SAS? Stata? Okay. All right, so some people. Um, for people who don't know, especially sophomores here, the world's changing, right? We have data that we had never had before in the history of, of man. Uh, in the early 1900s, the idea of a good data set was something that had 50 to 100 observations. Now the idea of a good data set is something that's multiple terabytes. Well, that's not something that you can look at by hand. So typically in economics, we use statistical programs to be able to look at it and be able to answer these questions. It also, also allows us to do a lot of mapping capabilities. For example, if we know the latitude and longitude of every business, now we can find them on a map. So using things like Stata, and in this case, Python, I ended up developing a script to be able to match surname files of the business owner or the administrators to the data collected through census surname files. So starting in 2000, again in 2010, and they haven't released the 2020 data, the census went out. They found out information about everybody. I mean, it's their entire job. That's uh, what they're supposed to do every 10 years. And it turns out that they had a lot of names. So they created the surname files that looked at, here's the last names of everybody in the United States, or the ones that were more prevalent than the sort of threshold. And what percentage from each racial and ethnic category did these last names come from? For example, my last name is Clemens. I think it was like 99.7% of the time, my last name Clemens was associated with white, right? So being able to know where these last names are most commonly associated with gives us some information about the probable or likelihood that a business owner may be associated with a particular racial or ethnic group. Is this perfect? Absolutely not. But it's the best we have and it's a starting point, right? So point three was creating a cutoff probability. That's really cool if I can name people, but the last name Brown is about 55% associated with black or African-American, like 42% associated with white, and then a little bit of other stuff, right? That is a little bit messier. I'm not quite sure what ethnic or racial group that that last name might come from. So I typically have a cutoff point around 90% where it says, I need to have at least a 90% confidence that this last name is associated with a particular ethnic or minority group to consider them that so that I can develop my data set of minority business owners so I can figure out where are they? Are there ethnic enclaves where they might be clustered together? Are they in some cities and not in other cities? Because this is something really important for us to know about if we're going to approach the differences in regulations in cities, right? So let me give you an example. Pablo Picasso, very famous, really pretty artwork, right? Very long name. But if we take this last section of the name, and we end up doing the standardization procedure. We get rid of the capitals and everything else so that we can match it to the census surname files and it will likely have a match. Well, then we can come down and see in the census what this is and what the distribution is. So for Picasso out of the United States, the people with the last name Picasso, 15.3% of the time were white, 83.82% uh, of the time were Hispanic, and then there were also some in, in black are two or more races. No Asian or Pacific Islander, no Asian Indian or Alaskan natives that were associated with this last name. So this gives me information on what this last name would be like if I saw this business owner. Now notice that I'm not sure. This is not above 90%. So I'm going to go ahead and throw it out and say, I'm not 100% sure, hold on, 90% confident that this is going to be associated. So that's sort of what I did for every single one of these business owners. And from there, I've developed a series of maps looking at sort of the density of different groups. 
So we have white, we have uh, Asian, we have black, we have Hispanic. I tried to find out where these business owners work. And that, this, was, this is one in of itself difficult, right? It's something that just hadn't been done before, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it started to at least make it so that we could answer the question, right? So with this data on about 8.8 .8 million business owners, of that, I can about, with at least 90% confidence, identify about 1.5 million of them. Well, that's a lot of people in a lot of cities to be able to try to have this comparison or understand where people might be located, right? This allows me to create a series of different variables. Now, does it, is it 100% accurate? Probably not. But it does allow us to have city to city comparisons. I can say, are there more Hispanic associated last names among business owners in Charlotte as there are relative to Charleston? We can now make some sort of interpersonal comparison in a way that we weren't able to do so before, right? So from here, we were able to compare between cities the rate of minority owned businesses, use population weighting effects. So thinking about what's happening in the population, uh, the distribution of, of individuals within that population. So not only do we need information on the business owners, if there is 40% Hispanic ownership in an area, but 80% of the population is Hispanic, that is a difference that we need to know or understand. So we add in population weighting measures to be able to understand what these relative differences are. Because having 10% of the businesses being Hispanic in, for example, Dallas, Texas versus Billings, Montana, would be two completely different situations. So we have to have some sort of understanding for this. Uh, this also, we were able to finally understand business ownership as represented by Black, Hispanic, Asian Pacific Islander, American Indian, Alaska Native, and individuals who identify with two or more races. The main ones that we're gonna talk about results with are going to be these first categories, Black, Hispanic, and Asian, uh, just because there, there's not enough data to be conclusive on, on the other business owners or to be able to say if we're sure that this correlation may exist, right? So while we're able to determine the probability that a name is associated with a specific race or ethnic category, this method cannot account for every individual circumstance. I just wanna go ahead and preface this now, it's not perfect, but it's at least the best we can do. So uh, I know you're probably not going to be surprised by this first one. The places with the highest rates of minority business ownership kind of makes sense if we think about it before population weighting. So Miami, San Jose, San Antonio, Houston, New York, New Jersey, that kind of makes sense. And then the places with the lowest rate of minority business ownership, places like Lincoln, Nebraska, Fargo, Portland, Billings, Sioux, Sioux Falls, that also kind of makes sense when we're necessarily thinking about it. But what happens when we add in population weight? When I start thinking about ranking these places, when I consider both the distribution of racial and ethnic groups within the community as well as within the business owners and have a population weight for this, the distribution changes a little bit. We still have some of the highest prevalence in places like Florida and Texas, but now we have places like Arlington, Virginia showing up, Albuquerque, New Mexico. We're starting to notice that in some places there is a higher representation of minority business owners relative to the population than in other places. And then we saw there might be different sets of places that aren't necessarily doing a good job of representation. Uh, Portland, Maine, Jackson, Mississippi, Cleveland, Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio. It turns out all the Ohio's did not rank well. Uh, and Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So what have we gotten to so far? We've approached two of the problems. Why has no one studied this? Well, lack, lack of individual city data. We got that from the DBNA. Lack of information about minority business ownership. Not perfect, but we do have some understanding of that now. So what are we going to do about the research? Well, let's get back to that base question. Let's think about that again. How can we use the city level regulatory data to understand minority owned businesses? This is important, right? This is an access question. So, Let's go by subsection. I'm not gonna bother you with tables. We're not gonna go through all of that um, because I didn't know what the different sort of distributions of empirical skills in the room should be. I know, I know many of you, you said you're freshmen and sophomores. We're gonna just start thinking about how these things might be correlated together and talk through some of them, right? So we're gonna do it by different main categories. So first let's talk about the ease of starting a business. So remember that these are things related to how you have to do your paperwork to be able to start your business. How long is that going to take you? How much is it going to cost? Starting a business is tough, right? Notice that most people in this room haven't done it. It's difficult to be able to start a business and it takes a lot of strength and power and, and you know having financial ability to do so. So the ease of starting a business is measured with these city level policies. 
And to give you some background, they wanted to make sure that the city level policy information that they had was consistent among the different cities. So one of the ways that they did that was by having teams of students like you pretend like they're setting up a business and they would contact the city boards. And they said that they have a very uniform set of businesses. They said, where is it? That they were creating a limited liability company with general commercial activities, right? That's 100% domestically owned, had up to 50 employees, does not qualify for financial incentives, and has startup capital at two times the income per capita of the business owner. This information going around to every single city was how they figured out the distribution of how friendly or what sort of procedures or what sort of regulations they would be related to starting a business, right? A one standard deviation increase in the ease of starting a business. So one standard deviation increase in the ease of starting a business uh, was related to having a 1.4% increase in minority business ownership. As it became a little bit easier to start a business. There were less barriers. It took less time. There were less procedures. There was less institutional knowledge that you may need to know in order to start this business. And the more minority business ownership we started to see happening in those places. And this is a very big deal. You might say, oh, that's 1.6 people or 1.6%, right? Well, considering the average city in our sample has 38,166 businesses, that's a lot. For Charleston, it's about 55 new businesses. Can you imagine a neighborhood in Charleston all of a sudden overnight having 55 new businesses, each hiring between five and 50 workers. I mean, that's a lot of employment. That's a lot of new money coming into an area that could change lives, right? So thinking about the starting a business aspect, that's important. All right, let me get to the idea of employing workers. Charleston, this is where you're shining, right? Um, it turns out that it's easy to employ workers. It doesn't mean that they're always there, but that it is easy from a regulation standpoint to be able to employ somebody to work where you are. Well, for this measure, they also had a fictitious worker at working at this same sort of company. So they would go and they would say, hey, I'm a company wanting to have workers. Uh, this is my information about the company. What would it be like for someone who works full time in their second year? Because in the first year, there's typically penalties. But in the second year, what would that look like in this city? What sort of protections are there for them? What sort of protections are there for the business? What is the regulation environment like? Right. So in these initial results, the ease of employing workers did not seem to really have any effect whatsoever, which is actually kind of surprising. It turns out in encouraging minority business ownership might be more related to the idea of how long does it take you to set up the business. When we get to the idea of employing workers, even though Charleston's doing necessarily well at it, that didn't seem to be an influential factor in why minority business ownerships may be more or less likely, right? Uh, let's do some more. <laughs> Who drove here today? Who spent more than five minutes looking for parking? So at least one. I had two. Okay. Outside of a place where you have a parking pass, when was the last time? And raise your hand if it was less than a month ago. Was it less than a month ago since you had to circle around the block looking for parking multiple times? Yeah, I'm guessing a lot of people, right? Turns out land and space use is one of the most diverse measures within the study. Thinking about how are people using this space? How, what are the regulations related to using the space? And making comprehensive measures of all the annoyances of daily life. The idea of like, is there parking available? Uh, what sort of zoning is there for commercial activity? What sort of zoning is there for residential activity? How can you transfer the titles or deeds for these properties? Thinking about these, uh, in surveys of new business owners, property acquisition and zoning are often one of the hardest steps during the startup process. Turns out, when you go talk to new business owners, they don't always complain about getting their first employees. They don't always complain about having to go fill out their paperwork. I mean, they do, but they don't always complain about that. One thing they do complain about is, well, it is very hard to find a location. I'm having to negotiate with people over things. I'm having to get zoning. I'm having to go talk to the government and get like multiple permissions to be able to put my business in the shop and thank you all these pieces. So it turns out that is consistently one of the things that business owners complain about the most. So it can affect where you locate your business. What I found out is that when we decrease the difficulty in the land and space use, when it becomes a little bit easier to transfer these property titles, when it becomes a little bit more realistic to, to be able to pay for all the zoning requirements they need or to go talk to the zoning boards, that when we lower the difficulty on this, 
by one standard deviation, we saw an increase about half a percent of minority business ownership. Again, that's huge. In a place where there might be lots of zoning regulations, if you can remove a few of them, to be able to have new businesses flourishing in areas that might be able to empower college completion, in places that might be able to empower um, hiring or, or quality of life. Like that's, that's something that can be sizable. And the last one that I actually found the most surprising was the category of paying taxes. I would have, if you asked me my prior, I would have said this one, this one's gotta be the biggest piece. Um, turns out the ease of being able to pay taxes didn't really have any effect whatsoever on minority business ownership. I guess that's because most small businesses uh, can use TurboTax, you do this the paid version, but they could use it. Most larger businesses are going to have accountants. So it turns out that the ease of actually being able to pay your taxes and what those tax rates are, that didn't really seem to affect minority business ownership. Instead it was, what are the different policies, the number of people that you have to talk to for land, the number of people you have to talk to to start your businesses, those are the things that seem to matter, but not necessarily the, the headaches such as paying taxes or, or employing workers. That piece was relatively consistent. Well, this tells us something. This tells us a couple really interesting things about what the, the regulatory barriers might be for some groups or some marginalized communities within cities. Now, are there limitations to this study? Absolutely, let's talk through those because I'm gonna be upfront and honest with you all. Um, is my name matching perfect? It's the best thing we got. It's what the literature is using right now, but until we actually have a survey that goes to every single business owner and asks their race or ethnicity, I could not make those strong assumptions, right? So and there's also a limited sample size. The Doing Business North America data set is currently only available for three years. As this continues to grow, it's gonna be so cool. As they add cities, as you get multiple years, as you can start to make comparisons over decades as opposed to three years, that's going to be a game changer. But as of right now, we can only really look at correlations. We can look at how these things might be related to one another. We can't actually say causally, when you lower taxes here, this happens. Or when you lower the parking space requirements for businesses in Charleston, you have more businesses showing up. That we can't say yet because that's going to take time. But guess what? Many of you have time. Lots of you will end up going to grad schools. Many of you might end up deciding to tackle these problems over the next 30 or 40 years of your career. So by then, data is going to really get to the point where you can start to talk about what is the special part of a city relative to other cities. And I think that that is so cool. Another thing we need to talk about is the surveying files. Not, not always perfect. The census does a good job of being able to provide all that it can. But until the census goes out and actually talks to business owners and reports that data to individuals, we're not going to be able to make the strongest um, uh, causal effects. Ever. Right? But this means that there's, there's opportunities. The first set of opportunities is in policy change. You know, why study cities? It's because many of you live in those cities. You care about your community. You want to work with legislators to be able to make a place where, where people can flourish or when they can start businesses or when they can hire workers, right? As, as data continues to become available, we will be able to understand the long-term impact of policy changes. If Charleston makes a new rule on how you have to hire or pay workers, if there's new regulations related to the ease of starting a business in Atlanta. How does that affect the southeastern region? If we make giant changes to tax rates in Illinois, where I am, or fix the pension system, which would also be just wonderful. I would really appreciate if we did that in Illinois. If we did those things, how is that going to affect businesses long term? These are questions we're finally going to be able to answer one day. And I think this is a really cool resource to be able to approach these sorts of questions. Also, there's lots of opportunities in spatial economics. Chris, the urban guy, I don't think is here. Well, mostly sophomores. Have you taken urban economics yet? No? It's a cool class. I would highly recommend if you have just like a flex time in your schedule or you're an econ major, that maybe that's something that you think about. Because the world is changing. We're starting to have very specific data. I know where all the business owners are. We can have Yelp data in a matter of seconds now. We can have all this information. We know things not at what's happening at the state level, what's happening at the national level. We can now say what's happening in your neighborhood. So these sort of possibilities to be able to answer spatial related questions or think about if this policy changes, how does it affect my community or my neighborhood? These are really important interesting ways that I think data is starting to go and that you all, as some of the students of tomorrow, can really start to answer these questions, right? So, Responsible social scientists, 
always need to consider that there is a difference between correlations and causation. This is all the way back from like Jevons thinking about sunspots creating commercial business activity hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It's a lesson that we all need to learn. That sometimes we're looking at correlations. These things just happen to happen at the same time. What we as economists want to know is how can we think about the cause and effect? And that's something that's taken over lots of data over a long period of time. Okay, so there's lots of implications from this research. There needs to be more of it and there needs to be more time, but let's think about what those implications might be, right? Prioritizing business ownership is one avenue to empower communities and to allow more market access. It turns out that there's a few regulations that we would be able to pinpoint that if we were to reduce those barriers might allow more people to have businesses and to flourish within those communities. Uh, increased entrepreneurship within marginalized groups, particularly at at-risk communities, this can cause wealth accumulation, feelings of achievement and confidence among business owners. And those are things that we've already as a society have kind of said, you know, that would be great. It, it would be wonderful to be able to empower others, right? Uh, these businesses also provide a high amount of jobs to members of the same community, which is an important source of employment. And these important sources of employment also later on lead to higher rates of college attainment. This leads to higher rates of, of uh, further successful business ownership, uh, higher social mobility, higher income mobility, higher geographic mobility of people being able to go to communities that they might be interested in going to, right? So I find that policies directed toward promoting tax compliance and the ease of setting up electricity. So far, this doesn't seem to matter. The paperwork hurdles, the paperwork to employ a, a worker, the paperwork to pay taxes, the paperwork to be able to get your electricity, that doesn't seem to matter as much. What seems to matter is the length of time it takes you to do something, right? Uh, policymakers, if they were going to go make decisions based off of this very small study, um, we, we should instead try to grow these studies by working as, as groups. But policymakers should consider addressing regulatory hurdles such as maybe the number of steps required to set up your business. Maybe this could be something that's made easier that people can do at home. Why do you need to go to offices to talk to different people to set up things? Maybe this is something that you could do on your own in your own time. Maybe there's a way that we can reduce some of these hurdles to make things more accessible to people. Uh, other things that we can do is think about the amount of, I don't know why I have some typos in here. I am so sorry about that. But about the number of days required and these other startup costs. And also the land and space use piece. Do you know how many businesses fail each year typically because they're just caught up in a zoning battle? Thinking about where you might have residential versus commercial activity. It turns out it's actually a lot. See, you're probably interested in this. You do real estate, John. It's, it's a lot of businesses that are affected every single year by zoning regulations. So this might be a way that we could try to simplify the process in order to not only make existing businesses better off, but maybe new businesses coming in better off. So did I address the three points? I don't think so. We addressed the first one. We need to sit on the level data. Boom, we got that. We can address the second one. We need information on minority business ownership. We managed that one too. You know the third one? is the idea that there needs to be research in this field. I did this first piece. Um, you as students who are going to go out and change the world and you're going to do research for your senior thesis or for your master's programs, or maybe you're a market process scholar who wants to talk to Pete right here that can tell you all about what's going to happen or what has happened or all these different regulations. Are you someone who's never met the center before and you want to be a market process scholar and think about these research things in the long term? This is your role to be able to help with the, the research onto this question or to continue into this piece because research isn't done alone. We're, we're not in vacuums. Uh, a lot of the time it's, I show you what's been done so far and then you get to do what's next. One of the great parts. So um, it wouldn't be coming to College of Charleston without giving you a quote about Adam Smith. Right. So in general, if any branch of trade or any division of labor be advantageous to the public, the freer and more general the competition, it will always be the more so. The idea that if we have these sorts of ways that we might be able to specialize, we might be able to have new businesses, and these businesses are, are attractive, and, they, and they're advantageous, and then the community's better off. If we have even more competition, maybe we lower barriers and allow in more and more businesses and more people flourish, the even better off businesses end up being, the more advantageous to the community they are. By, by having the ability to be there, right? So with that, uh, my name is Alicia Plemons. 
I have a long list of things underneath my name, but for the most part, I just want you to know that I'm here to talk to you if you would like. And with that, let's start with questions. Does anybody want to talk about things? Yes. Are there specific industries or specific like subsects of businesses mm -hmm. that are more affected by these regulations than mm -hmm. others? So that part I haven't really necessarily gone too far into. What I've noticed so far is the main ones tend to be hospitality and tourism accommodations and construction are some of the main ones that are affected. Anybody else? Yeah. So based on what you found, okay, and given the regulations that exist in places, are there industries that seem to be more prevalent than minorities maybe have an easier access to right now? Um, even though we want to have greater access for all of them, are there some that seem to be greater industry access than others? Yes. So most of them are ones that tend to be low barrier to entry startup. So jobs where, for example, Uber, Lyft, um, anything of Grubhub, uh, being able to have your own sort of company that works through different types of companies, such as delivery companies, those tend to be really, really small startups that at least have easy access, regardless of what these situations are. Another cool one is ghost kitchens. Has anybody heard of ghost kitchens? This one's cool. Yeah, some people are dummy. Have you noticed that on like when you're going to Grubhub and DoorDash lately, every now and then there'll be something that like you're pretty sure that restaurant's not there. Like Mr. Beast Burgers. Mr. Beast is a Twitch streamer. Why does he have a burger place in Charleston and Edwardsville, Illinois, and all these other sorts of places? Well, ghost kitchens are the idea that there are group kitchens that aren't really a restaurant. It's 10 or 12 restaurants that only exist online are all operating in the same space and people can come pick up and, and deliver from there. Things like that, low cost restaurants that, that you're able to uh, put in very quickly or low cost hospitality, tourism and accommodations. That seems to be some of the industries that there, there's already a prevalence of minority ownership and that that minority ownership is even more encouraged by, by having easier barriers to entry. Does that answer your question? <laughs> um, so I know we have just different students here. Are all of you econ majors? Where are you from? What's your major? Um, thinking about being in accounting. Oh, accounting is pretty fun. I like accounting. How about you? Uh, even better. Okay, so this stuff's very interesting, or at least relevant to you. How about in the back? What was your major? Uh, systems engineering. Systems engineering. Okay. All right. Are you thinking about starting a business at some point? <laughs> Did you know this is a side point? We can get back to it later. Um, it was actually a bunch of French economists and engineers who both worked on a lot of the theoretical foundations of statistics that later grew into the principles of microeconomics and now the micro that we use now. And that's why pretty much every engineering program requires at least one econ degree or one, one econ uh, class is because just engineers really revolutionized the field 200 years ago. That's not necessarily too important. But what I'm seeing here is there are lots of people from all over who might be interested in this sort of topic uh, because it's something that might be relevant to you, not only socially, but within your own industries. So that's kind of why I always like to give the pitch for why coming to things like this related to economics is so important. It's because economics is not necessarily a major, well, it is a major, but it's not just a major. It's a way of thinking and approaching problems. Looking at something and saying like, hey, this is something that I would like more information. I would like more information about this or that. Oh, did I accidentally open this up? No, I did it by accident. Oh, you're, well. you're, you're fine. <laughs> oh gosh, you get to see me multiple times. Okay. <laughs> Here, I can. I didn't realize how wide my hips were. Is that bad to say? <laughs> no. Yeah. So I, economics is a way of thinking and approaching problems that is really interdisciplinary that you're able to use from multiple locations and multiple viewpoints, because this is a way of just helping you to think about maybe international communities, to think about how your form of, of ways of approaching problems are your accounting firm might be able to compete in an area or what, what sort of goods and services you can provide that might be advantageous compared to other ones. It's not only about this, this idea of econ is only a way of approaching some questions. It's the dull thing that we do supply and demand graphs. It's the idea of building a toolkit so that you can answer all the other questions that you find really interesting. So that's kind of always my pitch of, I think econ's cool. And thank you for coming to something like this, even though it's not in your field. All right. Any other questions? Did I accidentally end too early? <laughs> if so, I might be giving you all the gift of a few extra minutes today.
but as always, I'll take the prerogative. Let's do it. Right. So, um, zoning, right? Yeah. And space use. To what degree is someplace like Charleston where we have all kinds of historic regulations, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a common thing that you see? In other words, there are, is across the cities. Yeah, it's our historic districts. You know. Really problematic for this, as oh. opposed to. Do you know anything about? Uh, I can tell you what other people's research is, not necessarily my research, but. Um, so Yang Zhao over at the University of North Texas does an interesting paper looking at historic districts in Denver, and this isn't only his results, but it's also based on the other papers that he had talked about, where he did find that I think the location of businesses and the success of businesses do seem to be uh, affected by where historic districts are. And that historic districts can have long-term effects on property and housing values around them that might make cause other compounding issues. Notice that we didn't have a zoning number in here when we're thinking about it for is there a historic district or not. So that might be one way in which the data set can be improved. Uh, one of the representatives from DBNA might be on the Zoom. If they're not, that's okay. Uh, it's run out of Arizona State University. If you have any suggestions like things such as adding historic districts or maybe something else that might not currently be considered that you might think, ah, weird. Charleston, number one for employing workers, did they think about this problem? If there's something like that that's not accounted for in the data set, there's a reason why it considers 120,000 different observations. That's something that we can add in later and improve to help use the data better. So maybe that's not something we have right now, but it's something that we can add in the future. And by we, I mean Arizona State. I don't know why I'm saying it like I'm part of that, but I try to help them on this data set. <sighs> Everybody having fun? So I do see that we have Three, three little thingies. Are any of those important? Those are us. Oh, okay. Even better. Well, it was, it was me. people at home, if you have questions, feel free to play along and, and tell some stuff too. Yeah, it was me saying, if you have questions, put them in the chat. So. Yeah. Yes. So I know in some states, uh, not necessarily at the city level, there have been very specific policies designed to help um, minorities get into certain industries. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking specifically of um, California and their process through the legalization of marijuana. They implemented these licenses which mm -hmm. gave preference to minorities. Um, do those sorts of policies actually work? Do we have data on that? <laughs> so that's one that still needs to be explored. I do have some friends who are working specifically on the weed legalization one and minority business ownership. Um, turns out sometimes, sometimes it helps, but the problem is that's an extremely oversaturated field. So out of new people who get into uh, weed, weed specializations or weed distributions, almost 80% of those are going to fail within a few years just because it's a heavily saturated market. So yes, it does cause more minority business ownership. We won't help the minority business ownership, um, businesses that are able to sustain for long periods of time. So that might be something that the regulation may help, but it may also hurt in some way. So that's one that, that's the public choice argument of, of what is that trade-off and how could that affect things? But they're not the only ones with, with policies like that. Other things that I would love to see people uh, explore, which I think some of the students here who need research projects, feel free to steal any of these, is the idea of, well, what is the industry by industry piece? What about cities that bring in a policy temporarily related to um, trying to give more loans to minority business owners? What about ones that really try to approach historical redlining areas and, and try to make business loans more available in certain communities that did not necessarily have them before, or didn't have the prevalence of banking institutions before? So I think that's one of the cool parts of being able to develop this data set. This data set just gives you a common way of talking about things. You add in the next piece. And here I added in minority business ownership. You might be able to add in the piece after that where it looks instead at, oh, well, what happens to the different policies that happen in the area at the time? Because that's that's the basis of econometrics is thinking about what might these policy differences be or how might that affect things over time. So short question is, or short answer is you should do it. Uh, but I mean that in a nice way where it's, you should be able to look into this. And this is something that as the data grows and as the data builds, that's a question that we can start to answer. <laughs> um, with that though, when it comes to the idea of working with data, I, I will admit that data is changing. 
Um, for people who want to be accountants or people who want to get into international business or people who want to do everything else, there's now a form of life where we have millions and millions of data points at any time. So I would, you know, just as like the nice little advice, uh, recommend thinking about maybe the certifications that you have here related to Excel or coding or anything else to be able to try to figure out how are you going to be able to interact with this new form of way of thinking about businesses and how can you be part of the conversation about, about improvement? But should I pass it over to you? <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time. I just wanted to point out one last thing here, right, which is we really do want to get your feedback and your information on our events, right? So if you'll go out to this link and um, take this survey, it's for everybody to take and provide us information. It is also, if for those of you who have been um, incentivized to get extra credit, is our way of saying that you were here and you were present, right? So, uh, but it helps us then to also figure out whether or not we're doing a good job in terms of providing you with events that we think are useful. So please, and we appreciate that attendance. Let me just again tell you that we've got um, the next major events that are coming up for the Center for Public Choice and Market Process is Adam Smith Week. Um, it is our marquee event that we do every year and it is going to be a week long series of events and speakers. Uh, March 21st to the 25th. So coming up in just um, a little over a month. And I hope that we'll see you there. If any of you have any questions um, for Dr. Clemens, she'll be here, right? If you have any questions for uh, me about the Center for Public Choice and Market Process, right? We'll be around here for a little bit. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, appreciate it. Thank you.